I'm Cameron Safey from the University of Pennsylvania, and we're going to be uh, uh, discussing uh, spinal deformity today. Uh, Dr. Vincent Arlay is going to be giving our uh, keynote talk, um, and uh, we're going to uh, uh, get everything started. So I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and everybody coming uh, for this evening's uh, discussion. Um, you can uh, uh, ask questions in the chat box, and we will uh, try to respond uh, either in the chat box or uh, uh, online. Uh, so uh, without further ado, this is uh, Dr. Olay. He'll be discussing uh, anterior surgery for the treatment of sagittal malalignment, uh, a change in paradigm. Uh, Dr. Olay is uh, uh, our uh, uh, chief for uh, spinal deformity here at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, he's uh, uh, got a picture of his uh, sailboat in the background, which he recently sailed across the Atlantic. So, uh, but I'll let him uh, uh, give his talk. Right, so it, it's back to, to Earth. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, correction of a surgery imbalance with anterior surgery. Uh, the, uh, everybody talks about, uh, uh, you know, posterior uh, spine surgery, osteotomy, and PSO, and uh, uh, I thought it would be interesting to review what we can achieve with anterior surgery. So the classic osteotomy for sagittal imbalance, of course, is a smith pedersen osteotomy that provides you a 5 to 15 degrees per level, depending on how the stiff the spine is. The old classic anterior posterior surgery, which was supposed to give you 10, 15 degrees per level. The pedicle subtraction osteotomy of 25, 35 degrees per level, depending on how extensive you do it. And the VCR that can go even beyond uh, this uh, PSO, which can provide you uh, more than 40 degrees uh, per level. So do we, uh, have we stopped to doing a PSO? No, we still do some PSO, but we do far less than uh, 15 years ago, uh, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and we have changed it. This is a classic example where we would still think of doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Um, uh, mid-aged woman who has uh, had a previous height and large. You can see she's flat back. And back in the day, I was uh, not using the computer, but I was doing cut out to see the amount of uh, correction I had to do. And uh, you do a basic restriction me and you get a sagittal balance. So this is a feasible options, uh, but we have new options nowadays. And the uh, biggest issue we found with the three column osteotomy is uh, uh, is the high complication rate, uh, which is reported in some series at 58%. And the neurology complication, which is still high uh, between 11% from uh, 10 years ago, but now some people report again 20%, some series go to 30%. People argue that uh, the uh, people get better, but what do you have a quadriceps palsy in, a, in an old patient or, or, uh, quite simply that four, it really comes back to five in my own experience and often they have need a cane to walk for the rest of their life. So, uh, so you have other issue with the uh, pedicle subtraction astronomy or three column astronomy. That's why we thought uh, we could do the uh, surgery with uh, the classic uh, anterior surgery and with the uh, hyperlododicase that uh, came in now. So we're going to go through a few examples. This is a former pilot. Uh, he's retired. He had a surgery for spinal stenosis uh, and, and a fusion from three to five. Uh, he has no leg pain, but he's only got back pain. He goes and sees a surgeon who tells him, I told you I would treat your spinal stenosis. Uh, you're doing fine. Back pain, there's nothing I can do. Mission accomplished. And, and the poor guy, he couldn't do anything. He was, uh, couldn't enjoy his retirement. Uh, so he came to see us. Uh, and when you look carefully at his lumbar lordosis, you can see uh, if you have EOS film that is missing in the uh, lumbar lordosis. He is decompensated forward. His SVA is significant, probably around, around uh, 10, 15 centimeters. His Seattle angle, the Wagner angle, but the Ted Wagner doesn't like it us to call it on the uh, Wagner angle, but the Seattle angle is 20 degrees. So it's a patient we thought we have nothing to lose. Let's bring him back in the sagittal plane. So we would do uh, an anterior um, 5 1 uh, hyperlodic cage, as you can see here, and then just sort of extend his fusion uh, to the bottom. And this patient had absolutely no back pain afterwards went back to playing golf, has been very grateful 
for this uh, type of a surgery. And he only spent uh, uh, three days in the hospital. So, uh, and this is his x-rays uh, before and after the uh, surgery, where you can see we were able to align it in a very simple fashion when without any complicated uh, three column osteotomies in the back. Classic uh, Harrington uh, uh, instrumentation, 64 uh, years old uh, female patient had Harry Lukey uh, instrumentation uh, 35 years before. Uh, she cannot function anymore. She has this severe low back pain. Uh, she's uh, stooped forward and uh, she is really asking for surgery if we can help her. So the, once again, the AOS, which is very telling, I think we've improved our treatment since we have the AOS, it shows the severe sagittal imbalance. She's, even though she has a knee flex a little bit, it's still severe sagittal imbalance. The uh, uh, X-ray shows she's fused, not the right and rod goes to L4, but she's fused to L5. This is a patient we're going to do with the uh, bikini incision, a 5-1 inch discectomy, complete resection of the ALL, and get the correction with one level, and posteriorly, uh, very generous uh, Smith feet osteotomy to make sure the L5 nerve root are not pinched, and you get the sagittal balance back again. Patients stay this one only two days in the hospital and went back hiking uh, everywhere um, uh, since the surgery without any problem. More uh, complicated, the patient's gone with a very severe uh, uh, sagittal imbalance. He walks to the clinic at 90 degrees and his chief complaint is doctor, make me straight, I can't take it anymore. Uh, and you're going to see uh, the way he's standing in the clinic. I didn't have the EOS film at the time, but he had the extremely severe sagittal imbalance. So this is a patient where we uh, went into and uh, did a 3445 uh, 51 anterior fusion to a pararectal retroperitoneal approach, uh, did the whole correction uh, from the front. And then uh, when we took him from the back, we only had to put the rods in without any fancy uh, uh, posterior astronomies and to get the uh, correction and uh, uh, the sagittal alignment for these patients. What else can we do with anterior surgery? We can do a direct lateral antipsoas uh, hyperlobotic cages. Another example of uh, this uh, patient, uh, she's a, a 71 years old uh, patient. Uh, she has a, a previous fusion uh, 10 years before at four or five, then she required a, a severe pain, a spinal cord stimulator. Uh, she uh, is miserable, she has a lot of pain. The, um, a CT scan shows she has spinal stenosis at 3, 4, and 4, 5. She had at 5, 1 a previous uh, uteroplexy that made a probably the anterior 5, 1 a little bit challenging, especially that she is very uh, obese. Uh, so we thought that we would get the correction in this patient at the level of 3, 4, and 4, 5. We didn't, uh, uh, no, 2, 3, and 3, 4, and we didn't touch 4, 5, which had the wavy uh, end plates that would look uh, fairly bone on bone. And uh, we did this uh, lateral anti psoas approach with a muscle sparing approach, probably a, a three inches long incision, and uh, resect completely the ALL and put uh, lateral hyperlobotic cages, which are fixed only on one side, and you get the whole correction from the anterior surgery. And uh, posteriorly, you need to add some Smith Peterson osteotomy to make sure your nerves are nicely decompressed. And this is the result, the alignment that you get after this uh, type of uh, uh, surgery, where the correction was done a little bit higher than uh, the, uh, ideally we'd like to do it at 5-1 and or 4-5 in this patient because she was mostly obese. We did the correction a little bit higher and laterally because laterally uh, the obesity doesn't play that much. So then what else can we do? So in some cases, we can do a combination of anterior and direct lateral antipsoas hyperlobotic cages. So this is a 58 years old patient. She had a five years of surgery for scoliosis and uh, she is uh, miserable. She has a severe sagittal imbalance. As you can see, she has complete uh, lack of lumbar lordosis. She, uh, uh, she's even kyphotic in the lumbar spine, so she needs probably 50 degrees of correction uh, of in the lumbar spine. And on the top of it, she has a lumbar laminectomy uh, in the back. So as much as uh, 
I can uh, do door picking for hours. If I, there's any other way I can avoid do this door picking and go around the scar, I would choose to, to go uh, outside the scar. So this patient had two, as you can see, two discs that were not fused, five, one, and uh, two, three um, level uh, were not fused. Uh, so we thought we would be able, excuse me, want to uh, be able to get the correction at the uh, a 5 1 level and higher in the lumbar spine. So we went at early uh, through first through a bikini incision, uh, put a hyperloaded cage at this level, and then we repositioned the patient left side up and we did this uh, uh, correction at the upper lumbar spine uh, to get the whole alignment correct in this patient. And this, and once again, posteriorly, we took her back a, a few days later, and posteriorly, we only had uh, the rods to put in uh, to get the sagittal alignment correct. And that's her before the surgery on your left-hand side, and after the surgery on your right-hand side with a good correction of the sagittal alignment. Can you do more with anterior surgery and something that doesn't seem to be realistic? Can we overpower a previous fusion uh, from the front? means a patient who has a previous fusion from the back, what we would say in the old days, you do a back from back of five, four, uh, five, uh, 40 procedures. Can you uh, get rid of one of the uh, time and can you fix an overpower from the front? This is a patient who is uh, 50 years old. She has a uh, previous uh, uh, Harrington rod uh, for scoliosis when she was young. Then she had extension with the TILIF uh, from P to S1. She has the tip that's pushing on the nerve, and then she has a psoriasis on 5-1. So in this case, the psoriasis is a, a friend of yours, fantastic. She has a psoriasis. You're gonna be able to move everything you want from the front. So this patient, we went in early. Again, 5-1, remove the tip spacer from the front and put this uh, uh, big spacer with a wedge in the front. And, then, and this is on the left-hand side the surgery that was done uh, from the front after removal of the TDF. And then on your right hand side, the final correction once we had done the posterior Smith Peter Star on me to make sure the L5 nerve would be perfectly free. And that's her uh, uh, after the surgery. Uh, you can see uh, the perfect alignment, the surgical alignment, and a uh, good coronal uh, correction as well. And the patient did remarkably well uh, with a relatively simple surgery. It can be more complex. This patient is um, 50 year, uh, 58 years old. She had a previous uh, two-level T-lift in the lumbar spine. She's miserable, uh, bent over with a very severe sagittal decompensations. So we thought about uh, uh, doing uh, either PSO or uh, going in the front. The patient had this uh, T-lift uh, cases, but they don't look to be fused too well. So we thought we would go in the front, overpower the posterior instrumentation, which we did. And, and then when we went back posteriorly, uh, we could uh, get a very easy correction of a sagittal alignment. And that's what was achieved uh, with that. You see the AP view and then the natural view uh, on the, this uh, patient with a perfect correction of a sagittal alignment in this patient. Uh, so another example of overpower is not as dramatic as the other one. You see this uh, patient had previous fusion from L4 to S1. She had the slight spondylolisthesis L3, um, L4. The CT scan shows a solid fusion in the back, but doesn't seem to be very, very strong fusion in the back. So we think because the fusion is not very, very solid in the back, we can overpower it from the front. So go in the front of the spine, overpower the uh, posterior fusion, uh, get the cages in, and then put the, the patient uh, the uh, do the correction uh, from the back just by putting the rods in. So now, can we treat sagittal and coronal imbalance uh, with this uh, cage in the front? Uh, where you obviously you think, well, it's it's a case where you should do an asymmetric pericardial subtraction on army, but you're going to need to do in the fusion mass at the effect of the curve L3. You're still going to need to do a TD from at F45 and 51. Uh, to get uh, the anterior column support. So that's a lot of surgery. So in uh, this patient who had a coronal imbalance and who had two uh, discs that were free, four, five, and five, one, we thought we should be able to achieve uh, the coronal imbalance as well as the surgical imbalance by doing anterior discectomy, four, five, and five, one. And we would rotate the cage. 
So that means that they, they, these are wedge cage, but we're going to rotate them to get some correction from the front already initially. And we're going to, when we insert the cage, we're going to over distract the cage and put a little bit smaller size cage so we can mobilize everything from the back when we're going to be in the back. So that's what we did. We uh, went in the front and did four, five and five, one hyperlytic cage, which would be rotated. It doesn't, the six ratio doesn't show you too well, but then we went in the back and did the Smith-Peterson osteonomy at the four, five and five, one, linked the rod to the previous rod and got the sagittal alignment uh, nicely a patient has a slight flexion contracture, that's why you see him bending his knees, but his sagittal alignment is uh, nice and straight. So we published four years ago uh, our initial series. We've done uh, many, many more since that time. We could get a good correction of the sagittal alignment in our series of adult patients. But the most interesting is our complication rate was uh, lower than uh, the three column osteotomies in the back. And we only had a 4.1 percent of transition neurology complications, as opposed to the higher rate of uh, uh, neurology complication in PSO. And the blood loss was obviously less uh, than the uh, PSO. So I think the posture, the anterior uh, posture sequence, uh, uh, can be uh, considered when we're talking about the severe sexual imbalance. We can anticipate less blood loss, and complication rate should be lower. Just to show you example of a patient who has uh, uh, this uh, uh, previous, uh, this very sagittal imbalance. You can see how she walked with a small stride, her hands uh, uh, backward to uh, keep a balance on the left-hand side. And then uh, after surgery, uh, that's where she is uh, with the uh, correction of a sagittal imbalance with anterior and posterior surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arlai. That was an excellent talk, uh, and uh, those uh, videos are very interesting. Um, so we're going to open this up to uh, question and answer right now. If anybody has a question, uh, you can uh, just uh, uh, text or type into the uh, chat box. Um, and so while folks are doing that, uh, I, I have a couple uh, questions for Dr. Arlai. You mentioned, you touched briefly on uh, the complication rate. Uh, in your neurologic complication rate being lower uh, for uh, 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 anterior uh, deformity correction. What about uh, in your experience has been uh, the vascular complication rate and are there any things that you do specifically in your technique to, to help mitigate that or, or reduce your risk of a, a vascular complication? I, I think that's a very good question. Obviously, that's a major concern when you do this anterior approach. Uh, I think you have to work with uh, one uh, access surgeons you are comfortable with uh, and, uh, and be ready uh, so if you have a vascular injury to have him uh, be there to help you uh, fix it. Uh, I think meticulous uh, uh, surgery, uh, taking your time during the anterior surgery, the secret to uh, uh, avoid this uh, vascular injury. Uh, the, uh, you have to plan uh, with the MRI, looking carefully at the MRI to see what the bifurcation is, how you can approach the, uh, uh, the anterior aspect of the spine in this uh, uh, helps you just to decrease the incidence of complication, but obviously it's a concern uh, that exists, and uh, you have to be familiar with this type of approach of the spine. Doctor, I like just can I just do a follow up question? In this age group, a lot of the patients have calcific disease. What, do you have a, a cutoff on how much calcification uh, you'll accept before telling them that it's not safe to go above uh, L five S one? Absolutely. I think so. when you have L5-S1, you can go at L5-S1 even if you have classification because you are below the bifurcation and obviously uh, the uh, other levels are concerned. The, the worst uh, level when you have classification, the four or five levels, because you're going to need to uh, mobilize the bifurcation classification and it's uh, uh, may not be a good idea in these cases. So uh, the other the other levels, you can be lateral and you don't need to mobilize that much the, the vessel. So I'm nervous for four or five level when it's a lot of uh, classification. Uh, but the other level, five one for me, it's not uh, a big issue. And the other levels, uh, I think you just uh, play it case by case. Vincent, I had uh, a question for you as well. Uh, tremendous cases. 
Uh, and I'm proud to say that we're both Canadians, so that's that's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> but um, you talked about overpowering the posterior fusion and the instrumentation potentially. Can you give us a, a few pearls? How do you do that? My big concern has always been crushing the vertebral body and not really getting correction. And a lot of the patients that I see are so osteoporotic that I wouldn't dream of doing it. But what are some of your technique pearls when you do that? Okay, I think that's a very good question. First, I think if you want to go with the overpowered technique, you should start with when there's overt psoriasis in the back and see how well you can do the overpower. Uh, second thing, you have to use uh, all the little tools you can, you can have to do the overpower. So you put the patients on the uh, hinge of the table to jackknife the table. That's one thing. And then the other thing too is the uh, distractor, or the, like the charité uh, distractor we used to have when we we're putting this total disc replacement, which is very powerful. And you put it way, way in the back. So it, before you distract, you have to get your charité distractor, which has large paddles, way, way, way all the back. So it sits completely on the end plate. And then you can distract a little bit. Uh, then you just remove it to further discectomy, go back with your charity distractor. And what you can do is at the same time, you break the table, you jackknife it, you put a small tilif paddle uh, between the two uh, end plates of your charity distractor and you rotate it. That means the distraction is totally parallel between the two end plates. And this is going to avoid the... Um, the uh, you know the the uh, that you you're going to plow into the end plate. Obviously, if the patient has extreme osteoporosis, it's probably not a good idea. But what we saw in some cases where we had this uh, plowing into the end plate, we could still get a good correction where we're doing the Smith Peterson osteotomy in the back. Good, thank you. Um, I'll ask a question. This is Scott Blumenthal. By the way, the comment on the Charité distractor. We've incorporated that into all of our anterior cases, whether they're fusions or disc replacements. It's a very powerful parallel distractor to release the disc space. Um, so my question is, one, like as he said, wonderful cases and the studies talked about the corrections that you get. But I guess from, from, from my point of view, I guess I'm gonna ask is what clinical syndrome in these older patients you're treating? Is it mainly stenotic symptoms? Is it mainly back pain? Or is it mainly functional impairment that they just can't do what they need to do? And do you have any outcome data on how you do on um, either any of those things, leg pain, back pain, or function? So very often, these patients have a mix of uh, back pain and spinal stenosis. Uh, they have spinal stenosis and sagittal imbalance at the same time. Uh, so it is... Uh, uh, very often we have to take care of the spinal deformity, the sagittal imbalance, as well as the spinal stenosis that exists in the back. So we have to do a posterior uh, extensive decompression at the same time. So uh, do we have outcome uh, data? So we, uh, we've published uh, uh, two papers on this, which are good. I mean, overall our patients are doing, you know, I would say fairly well, 80, 85% of the patients are doing well. Is it 100%? No, obviously. We have some complication, we have some issues uh, with these patients, but uh, overall, uh, this is severe deformity and 85%, that's why I tell the patients, we improve them and we ch change their, uh, their life and their outcome. Well, thank you very much, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Dr. Arle, there's a question in the uh, chat room uh, asking about how you determine your, uh, your preoperative uh, correction uh, and how you uh, check that. I think they're very good questions. What, what we do in the clinic, uh, usually uh, we don't have the time to do a, a very uh, uh, sophisticated mathematics. So what we do is uh, we uh, calculate the uh, Ted Wagner angle, which is the Seattle angle. We draw a line on the EOS between the femur and the uh, and T1, and then to give you the angle, you have to correct the patients roughly. And this gives you an idea of uh, how much correction you need to, and obviously, Afterwards, when you look at, you conference a case in the office, you look at the pelvic incidence, you measure it, and then the number of doses, everything. But just to go in the clinic to be efficient, I find the Wagner angle is a fantastic tool. It gives you a very fast 
the amount of correction and rock that you need. I think another point which you've uh, pointed out during our uh, spine case conferences at Penn is that uh, the Wagner angle also takes into account knee flexion, which we do see on our, uh, our and hip uh, extension that we see on our EOS film. So it does take into account some lower extremity uh, uh, compensation mechanisms. Yeah, and the other thing too, when you have a thoracic lordosis, it doesn't just uh, take into account the thoracic uh, lordosis, because most cases, uh, if you stop at T10, the patient will end up with a thoracic kyphosis after the correction. The Wagner angle doesn't integrate this. So we, we have to do, uh, do something a bit more sophisticated afterwards, but I find it's a very good start to, to know roughly what you have to do the patient, the amount of correction you have to give. But I don't want to be uh, just uh, the only one talking, I think, uh, uh, our fellows have a, yeah. have a, a, a talk to give. So I have just one really uh, quick question. Are you still there? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. You can hear it. Uh, just for the fellows out there, what, the, we noticed on the x-ray that you're putting only the, the screws on the bottom of the anterior cages. And it might be obvious, but in the beginning of the fellowship, we were all uh, asking about it. And can you just uh, explain that real quick? Yeah. One of the things, you, you could potentially put the, the screws up and down from the cage, but you have to make sure uh, that your correction is achieved with anterior surgery. Because when you're going to go uh, in the back, you may, with a smith feet astronomy, uh, get a little bit more. And then the other thing, too, is when you put your cage, put screws up and down, uh, you may uh, keep a mismatch of your cage and plate to the uh, vertebra and plate. Uh, so that's the reason why I usually put the uh, screws on any one side that gives you a little bit more latitude to get a little bit further correction in the back and 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 uh, because it's still going to be uh, mobile in the back so uh, I've stopped putting screws on both the sides uh, uh, of the uh, of the construct Thank you. that's okay I think we're going to start with uh, Terry Ishmael he's going to uh, start with the first uh, uh, case presentation here Okay, so Terry is our, one of our fellow who does the, the Penn uh, Shriners uh, Fellowship and, and he's uh, going to move uh, uh, not very far from where we are. He's going to be uh, start his practice uh, next August at Rogers Robert Wood Johnson University and doing a pediatric uh, uh, deformity as well as adult deformities. So Terry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this first uh, patient, uh, her, she's a 22-year-old female that presented with a long-term history of lower back pain. Uh, she was initially diagnosed at about 10 years of age uh, by an outside physician, and um, she was braced, but then um, she was lost to follow-up. Uh, she represented about six years later with a recurrence of her back pain after cesarean section. Uh, she was treated symptomatically, but her pain continued to get worse, and she developed bilateral lower extremity pain. Uh, past medical history symptoms for, for morbid obesity and diabetes. An exam, she's an obese female with a BMI of 45. She had a right trunk shift, waist asymmetry, and a positive sagittal balance. Uh, she had four out of five strength in bilateral tibialis anterior and uh, an extensor hallucis longus. And she had normal uh, reflexes and sensation. If we look at her x-rays here, do show that uh, we can see her obvious uh, right trunk shift, which she had a left uh, lumbosacral scoliosis and measured about 35 degrees, and a right thoracic uh, scoliosis and measured about 37 degrees. Her PI is 54, LL is 13, uh, pelvic tilt was 35, sacral slope is 20, uh, thoracic kyphosis is about 5 degrees, her SVBA was about uh, 90 millimeters, and L4 S1 lordosis was about 11 degrees. Uh, so, um, you know, due to her uh, morbid obesity, uh, we recommended that she be seen by a uh, bariatric surgeon who ended up performing a robotic sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, she came back to us about nine months later, having lost about 35 pounds, and her BMI kind of fell to around 40. This is still pretty high, but you know, with her severe symptoms and the fact that she was uh, trending in the right direction, we decided, to we decided to proceed with surgery. Now she underwent a uh, anterior lumbar interbody fusion L4-5 with 30 degree hyperlodotic cage with a re reverse Bowman interbody fusion between five L5-S1. Uh, we used a uh, appropriately sized fibular allograft which is uh, placed uh, from anterior to posterior through the uh, superior end plate of L5 into the body of uh, S1. And then uh, she underwent a uh, decompression uh, from L4, L5, and 5, 1 with uh, instrumentation from uh, L4 to the pelvis. Sorry, uh, back to uh, the images. It does show that uh, you know, these are the mid-sagittal cuts of the CT scan, which show obvious spinal optosis 
of L5 and S1, and our MRI uh, spine did uh, confirm this as well as show marked L5 S1 for animal stenosis. So these are your immediate post-op images on the left side, and then these are her standing images about uh, two weeks after surgery. We can see that her sagittal and coronal alignment have improved significantly, as well as her pelvic parameters, which are here on the right. About six weeks after surgery, she had a ground level fall and was complaining of uh, some uh, right-sided groin pain. A CT scan was obtained, uh, which uh, did not show any uh, changes in her instrumentation. Thought this uh, mid-sagittal cut uh, was uh, kind of telling as we can see the fibular strut graft uh, going uh, from uh, the body of L5 into uh, S1. And these are her uh, images of final follow-up show that her heart was in place and she's well fused. And then she uh, has uh, no complaints and her pain is completely resolved at two years post follow-up. So in the case. Great, thank you, uh, Terry. Uh, the next case uh, will be presented by Sharif. Uh, Dr. Sharif is uh, uh, one of our uh, fellows as well. Uh, he's uh, done an excellent job today. We actually did an anterior case uh, today uh, that we uh, had to uh, break the bed back for and uh, got some excellent lower doses on that. So, uh, but uh, Sharif, can you present for us uh, uh, your case? Sharif, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself. That's good. Thank you. Uh, so we'll continue the adult deformity saga with a patient of a 48-year-old with a history of ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, this patient presented to our office with the severe uh, progressive uh, forward bending deformity and problem with horizontal gaze. He also had severe uh, thoracolumbar uh, pain. Uh, the patient was diagnosed with uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis at the age of 30, and five years prior to presentation, he sustained a fall resulting in an L2 uh, fracture uh, that was treated with the construct that we see here. And uh, shortly after this uh, surgery, the patient noticed that he's progressively losing height and bending forward, and now he was complaining that his ribs are sitting on his pelvis, causing a lot of pain. He also had a uh, severe uh, thoracolumbar constant stabbing pain with uh, uh, prominent hardware at that point. At this point, he was miserable and depressed and uh, bound to his house, not able to uh, participate in any activities. His past medical history was just ankylosing spondylitis. and. Uh, that's how he stood in clinic and you can see like how miserable he is. He was hyper uh, uh his, uh, his cervical spine to be able to look forward and he, it was very hard for him. Uh, uh, just to take a look at his numbers, uh, we can see that his thoracic kyphosis and his uh, lumbar pelvic parameters are with an acceptable range for an ankylosing spondylitis, but the two uh, magical numbers were his uh, proximal junctional kyphosis uh, of 33 degrees that led to an SBA of uh, 30 centimeters, uh, making him not able to stand straight or look in front of him uh, with the, what comes with the severe back pain, trying to compensate for that and the prominent hardware at this point. Um, that's just a quick look at his MRI uh, showing uh, two things that when he lays supine, his uh, hypotic angle did not change, actually a little bit increased, and his uh, cord is draped over his kyphotic deformity, and uh, that was given us idea that uh, correcting through the uh, thoracolumbar junction is not going to be uh, very uh, valuable. His lumbar CT showing diffuse, uh, of course, with the angst pondy, he's fused through the anterior and posterior elements. Uh, it's just telling us that we don't have to worry about fusion in this patient, but uh, it was uh, telling us that we need some, some sort of aggressive uh, three column osteotomy to be able to overcome this. And this is not one of the cases that we can uh, use the anterior approach to overpower the back or uh, we had to resort to the, 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 the traditional methods uh, and uh, his plan was 
consisted of T8 to pelvis with double PSL at L1 and L4. And we can see that that's how hard was his positioning is. Uh, we had to break the pro access table all the way to just accommodate for him and uh, make sure he doesn't get a lot of blisters on his chest. And this was his the beginning of the day. And uh, uh, we were able to do a L4 and L1 uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And he looked like that at the end of the day. I was not there, but I can't imagine. Uh, here is the two levels of the osteotomy. One and four and the four rod construct. And this is the, just taking a look at his new numbers. Right now, his uh, lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidents are very well matched. And uh, we can see that we achieved about 40 degrees through the L4 and about 20 degrees uh, through the L1 particle subtraction osteotomy. His SVA went from 30 centimeters to 4.7 centimeters, which is the norm. And uh, he was super happy. He was standing up straight this post-op day two, working with PT, standing up straight in five years, for the first time in five years. And he was, he was very, very happy with that. And uh, that's him three years out of his surgery. He's still doing great. He has neck pain and back pain from his ankylosing spondylitis, but he was just, he couldn't be happier. And uh, that's about it. So this is one of the cases that we did not use anterior approach, but it still works. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sure. And uh, just a question on that case to Dr. Orlick. For, for that case, you know, I noticed that uh, there was one pelvic bolt um, and we, we recently, I think we've uh, submitted it. I think it was accepted, but we haven't, it hasn't gone to press yet for uh, uh, unilateral versus bilateral pelvic screws. Um, it, what was your decision making in doing one pelvic screw as opposed to, you know, some of the cases that uh, both you and I have done recently will do uh, uh, two uh, pelvic bolts for our low three column osteotomies. Uh, what was your thought process for, for this gentleman? I, I think just uh, the, uh, uh, to put one iliac bolt is to, to prevent a, mostly a sacral insufficient fracture and uh, when you have scoliosis, I think you need two iliac bolts when you go to the pelvis. When you have, uh, you only want to prevent sacral distribution fracture for mid-size uh, uh, fusion, one screw is enough. As we're getting better at putting our iliac screws, most of the time put two screws now, okay? So, but it's, uh, uh, and this patient anyway had, uh, we uh, just, we, we had, he was already totally fused, so I had a four, I had the fixation four, five, S1 and the pelvic, so I thought we had the, uh, seven screws underneath the pedicle subtraction osteotomy, so I thought it was enough uh, in this case, but... Uh, and he was also ankylosing spondylitis, so... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Close the fusion, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah our, the, the recent paper, I think it's uh, uh, accepted but hasn't been published, showed that there was no difference in our patients who had unilateral pelvic bolts versus uh, bilateral, so... Um, and then I think uh, the last, uh, last person here, uh, Chris Caruso, who's uh, our third fellow, uh, is going to present uh, on uh, uh, a deformity case as well. Uh, Chris is uh, uh, similar to uh, uh, Terry, going to be uh, uh, starting practice in New Jersey, uh, not too far from us. The, 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 the big issue is with the training fellows, we're going to become our competitors, okay? So we're going to run out of business very soon. <laughs> That's okay. We'll we'll still send them down the uh, across the river to Pennsylvania. So Vince, uh, Vince, we we we've trained a lot of fellows in Dallas. Believe me, <laughs> there's still pl plenty of business. Definitely <laughs> those. Uh, last case I have today, or we have, is a patient slightly older in age. This is an 80 year old female with a history of an L2 to 5 decompression done about 20 years ago before she saw us. Her main complaint is that she feels like she's tipping forward and has a constant low back pain. She describes it as sharp in nature, no leg pain or ridiculous symptoms. Of note, uh, she did have a chronic history of bladder incontinence with a bladder stimulator that she uh, reported after her surgery in the 90s, and then uh, her major issues that she can't look up straight to walk around, which is a big concern for her. See her past medical history that we'll just skip over here. 
Um, so she walks with a cane. Uh, she's only able to take small strides uh, when she walks into the clinic, mainly because she feels like she can't see too far, uh, you know, forward because of how she's been forward. Uh, on exam, no significant neuro deficits, except maybe a little weakness in EHL uh, on the left side and also a toe rise as well. Otherwise, she has a forward flexion uh, of her entire spine to about 90 degrees. Uh, she was able to get neutral, but with extreme difficulty and uh, ext extension of her pelvis as well as knee flexion. Uh, there was no tenderness, although she had some minor SI joint tenderness uh, on the left side. And then uh, lateral bends about 20 degrees each way. Uh, she did get a CT uh, myelogram prior to uh, inter any intervention that was planned that showed a solid fusion um, and a laminectomy defect between L3 and L5. And of note, we do comment this freak on, on this frequently, either in MRIs or CAT scans, just how much lower doses they're able to get between L5 and S1, or excuse me, L1 to uh, S1 or L5, just lying flat and being somewhat relaxed. Uh, this patient uh, actually was given a muscle relaxant, which is interesting, uh, I think, as well. And that did help her relax. So she got to about zero degrees during her CT compared to where she was here. Uh, you can see on our standing EOS films, uh, her measurements here on the side, a significant uh, pelvic incidence. And then that mismatch of about 34 degrees uh, that we measured here. So the question uh, becomes, uh, what can we do for this patient? Of note, she is 80 degrees. Um, she did have a DEXA scan, which we routinely order um, on all these patients preoperatively. She was not osteoporotic. Um, I don't recall her T-score, but she was, uh, I don't believe she was even in the osteopenia category as well. So the discussion was about a, a posterior versus an anterior or combined approach for her. And the decision was made for combined approach. Here's the uh, anterior surgery that was done. On the left side, you see an intraoplural image uh, localizing the L5-S1 disc level. And this is a, a hyperlordotic cage. It's becoming more lordotic intraoperatively with a burr, burring down that uh, end plate of the cage to increase the lordosis here. Um, and we actually uh, did something similar last week, but we've done this before, to give some more lordosis. And you can see the insertion of the cage here on the uh, left side of the floral imaging prior to anything that was done posteriorly. And then you see here on the right side, or lordosis that was regained intraoperatively uh, after the posterior uh, uh, portion was complete. And finally, here are her films at the end. You can see the revision posterior fusion as well as uh, the anterior construct that was performed. We actually saw her uh, a few weeks ago in the clinic. She's extremely happy, has absolutely no back pain, um, and she's able to walk. She walked in without a walker and without a cane um, at this point, and she's extremely happy and doing very well at this point. It's a great case, Chris. Um, you know, it's interesting to note on your intraoperative films, there was a little bit of gapping on the anterior on the A-lift portion, but after you did your PCO, uh, you were able to uh, get uh, the end plates contacting your... I think, I may, may I interject? Uh, we, we, we checked with the fluoroscopy and we were not happy with the position of the case. So we, I repositioned it. You see there is on the left-hand side, you see uh, parallel distraction. Uh, and this is very important to check. Uh, so I removed uh, the, the screws and uh, rocked the cage to the bottom so the mm. cage would have a good contact with the S1 end plate. Uh, so, uh, so the cage has been repositioned between the uh, left and side. I think the middle slide doesn't show too well on the fluoroscopy. But it's very important to check that uh, you have good contact uh, with your cage once it's inserted. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Actually, the, the case that Sharif and I did today, we had a similar situation uh, that uh, we had distracted the PLL. It hadn't ruptured, but uh, uh, fortunately, we had uh, uh, planned for, uh, we had placed our uh, synfame retractors on the same side of the break in the bed. So we had anesthesia break the bed, uh, and we were able to close down posteriorly, and then we were able to get full contact. So I think uh, I agree with you. That's a, a very important point. Uh, two uh, questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, uh, Dr. Ziegler had asked what you use for uh, your um, uh, uh, bone graft in your uh, ALIS, Dr. Arlet. I, I use a uh, VBGen uh, uh, with the uh, mix of bone marrow aspirate. Uh, 
I, I've used a BMP. I have been a little bit disappointed in, uh, with BMP in some cases where I've seen a resorption around the end plate. So I, I kind of step back. Um, it's a dosage issue. And I, I put my cage with the uh, a mix of uh, uh, Vivigen uh, uh, with the, the uh, bone marrow aspirate in the front. Okay. And in the back, in most of these cases, I, I, which are quite extensive, we don't have enough fusion. I, I use BMP in the back in, in these cases, but I don't use it in the front, which is. <laughs> and then there's another uh, question here regarding O-arm and navigation. Uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, answer. I know your answer, but I'll let you answer that. <laughs> so, Nav I mean. Navigation. You, you, you can see on the, the, the picture in the background that I just, I, I love to navigate so you can see the books in the background. But my navigation is uh, only on the ocean. Otherwise, I do it uh, uh, freehand. Uh, all these cases, I, I do freehand. But I check uh, all my uh, screw placement uh, with a, a trigger DMG. After each single screw, I run an MEP. And I check uh, every single screw afterwards at the end uh, with uh, a regular C arm. Uh, but I would uh, rainbow the CRM and any doubt uh, at the placement of a screw, I would remove the screws and palpate the uh, screw or pathway with a straight ball pen tip and a curved one with an angled one to make sure that it's not breaching in. So um, uh, obviously you can use O-arm just to check all the screws, but I'm, uh, uh, I think it takes a long, long, long time to run an O-arm from uh, from T2, T3 to the pelvis, it's almost a three spin. It's going to take you a, a close to 45 minutes an hour, so. Yeah, so uh, I, I would agree with you on the time there. I do spin uh, my deformities afterwards and uh, it does take a while. It's very tech dependent, so uh, uh, different techs will, will take shorter or longer for that. Um, all right, so I think we're moving on to our uh, last talk. I'll be giving a, a, a talk on uh, sagittal malalignment uh, for uh, degenerative kyphoscoliosis. Um, and uh, this, uh, we'll go through here. So uh, let's see if we have, uh, I think you need to press at the bottom of the screen on the right. Okay, here you go. There we go, sir. Uh, all right, so this is a 65-year-old woman uh, who was uh, status post L4 to S1 posterior decompression infusion done at an outside hospital many years ago. Uh, she had terrible back pain uh, and had been treated by outside providers with a spinal cord stimulator followed by an intrathecal pump with baclofen uh, and came to me with uh, mechanical low back pain uh, secondary to her kyphoscoliosis. Uh, her uh, uh, preoperative EOS imaging uh, demonstrated a, a left-sided uh, scoliosis curve of 65 degrees. She also had uh, her deformity as uh, apex uh, in the sagittal uh, plane is apex at the thoracolumbar uh, junction with 75 degrees of thoracolumbar kyphosis. Uh, she had an SBA of uh, 20 centimeters. You can see uh, on the ladder, her uh, pelvic tilt is 49 degrees, so she's really compensating, uh, firing her hamstring muscles to uh, extend her hips and her pel and retrovert her pelvis uh, for some compensation. Uh, and her lordosis is only seven degrees, uh, uh, which is uh, quite a large mismatch from her pelvic incidence of 60 degrees. Um, and uh, as Dr. Olay mentioned before, you know, these, these uh, uh, parameters don't take into account uh, thoracic deformity, uh, which uh, I didn't draw on here, but she had a T1 pelvic angle, uh, which combines your pelvic tilt plus your thoracic kyphosis. Um, and uh, uh, it's been shown to actually be correlate to pain and patient report outcomes more so than uh, a PIL mismatch. And that's going to be, hers was around 50 degrees. And you want it to be under 14. So uh, quite a, a significant deformity. Uh, again, for all of these patients, uh, for me, the CT scan is extraordinarily important because I want to look and see uh, how much correction I get supine on the table, how much flexibility do we have. Uh, uh, and so you can see that that uh, thracolumbar junctional kyphosis from 75 degrees goes down to only 25 degrees. Uh, so she is uh, uh, has some flexibility in that thracolumbar uh, deformity. Um, and you can see though, uh, not true for her lumbar deformity where she only has, uh, she goes from seven degrees of lordosis to 10 degrees of lordosis. And then again, as Dr. Arlay mentioned in some of his talks, 
uh, are some of his cases that he showed. Uh, we've got a, a fusion here. This patient's been fused, uh, L4 to S1. Uh, four or five, she has instrumentation and she's been autofused five to one. So uh, uh, it, it's gonna be difficult and would require a three column osteotomy to get a correction there. Uh, the other thing that this uh, tells us is uh, the apex of her deformity is really centered at the thoracolumbar junction. Uh, and then lastly, you can see I've drawn out the Hansfield uh, units at uh, T3 and T4. So I always make sure to check those on my preoperative EO scan at my UIB and UIB plus one. Uh, to make sure that I've got good bone purchase at the top of my construct. And you can see here, she's got 133 household units at T3 and 126 at T4, which is, is very good. We always want to make sure it's above 100, certainly. And, and if it's around 130, then uh, that, that's, that's pretty good uh, in terms of bone purchase. Um, so this is, uh, uh, goes back to her. There we go. So surgical plan for her. So, you know, uh, had a discussion with her and decided to do uh, L1 to L4 uh, uh, anti psoas lateral lumbar inner body fusions, which Dr. Arlay showed on his previous uh, uh, cases. And uh, uh, this allowed for a significant correction. I do a lot of X lifts, but an X lift in this situation is not going to get you uh, the correction without an ACR and anterior column resection, which is uh, automatically comes with an anti psoas approach. And then stage two was the dough from T4. Uh, down to the pelvis with uh, uh, posterior column osteotomies at the thoracolumbar junction. Um, so I have a video here uh, that uh, of uh, a short portion of the case will show. Uh, so this is anteriorly uh, approaching uh, uh, and we're dissecting over the 11th rib. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, myself with Dr. Arlet here and uh, just teasing off uh, the, uh, the 11th rib uh, and, and resecting it to give us that uh, retro uh, peritoneal uh, access. Uh, once we get uh, the rib out, we've got a great exposure to the uh, uh, superior uh, uh, or upper lumbar spine. Uh, we clip our segmentals uh, and then bovie as well. Uh, and you'll see here in a second, so this is using peanuts, we kind of clean off anterior to the psoas. So uh, where it says left, that is uh, uh, the patient, the patient is left-sided up uh, here in this picture. So uh, and you can see we're incising the disc space there uh, and uh, uh, get into the disc space and we're able to get a, a pretty good uh, distraction of the uh, uh, end plates here. Uh, and that just shows resection of, uh, of the discectomy. Uh, one thing we do is uh, uh, we have the, and I, Dr. Arlay should very briefly, uh, we'll take uh, the uh, uh, hyperlordotic cages with the tabs. They come with two tabs uh, on each side. However, that's very difficult to fit uh, and, and very bulky and, and honestly it's, it wouldn't fit. So I, I just, we take a burr and just burr off the other tab, just use one uh, uh, tab. Uh, from the front, given these are hyperlordotic cages, I think it's important to uh, to put a screw in, otherwise they can kick out uh, anterior. Um, and so this is at the end. So this is hyperlordotic cages at L1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 4 above her prior fusion construct. Um, and then uh, just, uh, let's see if we can move on to the uh, posterior. So posteriorly, uh, T4 to the uh, pelvis. Uh, we, uh, um, if it'll come up here, here we go. So again, we did posterior column osteotomies, uh, particularly at the uh, thoracolumbar junction. Uh, this is just uh, uh, us doing the, uh, the uh, facetectomies and, and the uh, osteotomies there. Um, and uh, one thing, uh, so obviously place a rod, the most uh, sort of important part of the posterior uh, portion other than the PCOs, I think is uh, obviously the reduction of the deformity, particularly of the uh, coronal uh, the coronal uh, malalignment. Uh, sorry about this, we're having some technical issues. Um, so uh, here, uh, there we go. So, uh, and so we'll use two coronal rod benders um, simultaneously to minimize pull out of our screws. Uh, and that's uh, uh, very helpful. I've found uh, when I, uh, you know, I learned that technique from Dr. Arlay. Um, you know, previously I was doing one coronal bender at a time. Um, and, and so I placed much more stress on the spine and the screw. So this, this here we have offset coronal benders. So they are custom made and one is higher than the other. It allows both surgeons to do uh, coronal bending simultaneously. 
Uh, we do the same thing for the sagittal uh, uh, correction with the insight to sagittal benders. So on both sides, it just helps to uh, uh, decrease the force on any one given screw and reduce the risk of uh, uh, pullout. Uh, and then uh, I typically place cross links at the top and bottom of all my uh, uh, constructs. Um, so that's the uh, video here. Let's see if we can uh, move on to the next slide. Um, Maybe you should show the, the final result because there might yeah. be some questions in the uh, from the floor. No? Yep. So this is the final. These are the final results. So uh, we corrected her. You know, just looking at the AP pre-op versus post-op, corrected her sagittal, uh, uh, or rather her coronal uh, malalignment uh, with uh, a combination of uh, 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 coronal uh, benders as well as a uh, uh, distraction on the uh, uh, con uh, vexity or concavity and. and uh, compression on the, uh, the convexity. Uh, and then on the lateral, you can see we've gotten our correction, um, both because she was a bit supple from, uh, from our CT scan, as well as our posterior column osteotomies at, uh, at the thoracolumbar junction, and then our anterior uh, hyperlordotic cages above her prior fusion site. Um, and she's, uh, she's extremely, extremely happy with, uh, with her results. So uh, let's see if we have any questions here from uh, uh, any of the panelists or uh, the folks in the in the chat. Um, uh, there was a question from earlier. It, say, uh, it says, uh, looks like S2AI uh, and ELIAC bolts on each side, decisions for this. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Olay, that's from uh, your prior case. Yes. Uh, I think it's just uh, regarding the pelvic screws uh, uh, in this uh, deformity, uh, I find it, it's, uh, uh, I would put the pelvic screw that is just an easier one to insert. So it sometimes is the, uh, uh, what we call the anatomic screw, the, the screw that uh, right outside the SI joint, I think just like the one you do in Seattle that the end, uh, Chapman does. Or S2 iliac screws on the last uh, solution would be to the old uh, iliac bolt fashion, but then you need a connector, which we don't like because uh, we find that patient has significant amount of um, uh, posterior superiac pain when we do this. Uh, but when you do a revision, defensive replacement screws, so we either put uh, anatomic screws uh, right outside the SI joint or S2 iliac screws, depending on, on the uh, uh, on the case and. Uh, more and more now in this adult, as we have uh, uh, some rod breakage, as it was published by Chris Amos in a range of 10%, we put uh, more and more four rods in our construct. So the way we do it, we would put uh, two, iliac, uh, two S2 iliac screws, uh, one on each side, and then just two anatomic uh, uh, screws as well. So we have uh, four uh, pelvic screws at the bottom. And uh, it's possible to put S2 iliac screws and then another one atomic iliac screw as well. And we run the rods uh, from each one of these screws uh, uh, to a uh, um, cephalad. This gives us a, a very, very good, good construct. I think it's important to know the different ways to put pelvic screws because you may be in a situation where one screw is not possible, you don't find it, uh, and you want to move fast in this case uh, because there are so many things you have to do that you have to move fast. Uh, and the iliac screw is only one part of the whole surgery you have to do. Yeah, I would I would echo that. The only other thing uh, uh, I would mention is uh, you know the uh, the last time I used two iliac screws on each side was uh, right my last case before COVID uh, uh, before we stopped for COVID was a, a L5 PSO uh, and obviously we needed to get uh, uh, more fixation points below. We wanted to have three fixation points on each side, so we had uh, we placed the uh, S2AI screws and then uh, 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 traditional iliac bolts, but with a, a medial uh, uh, start point, uh, which is actually something I learned with from Dr. Arlay when I came here, uh, that uh, uh, he, he places his uh, pelvic bolts uh, from a medial trajectory and or a medial start point rather. And so uh, it, it starts on the pelvis, it doesn't go through the sacrum, but uh, it allows you to uh, connect to your uh, construct without a uh, side connector and it's uh, low profile as well. Uh, one, one quick point. One quick point on the actually was the previous case, and obviously, um, you know that, that those of us at TBI we do a lot of anterior spine surgery. The previous case was an 85 year old with anterior spine surgery. We have a lot of respect when we 
consider going anteriorly on the older patients because that patient didn't happen to have it. I saw in the films, but a lot of patients have anterior vascular calcification and you have to be, for at least for the participants, you know, be very, very wary about and doing anterior spine surgery on really old people. I think it's just something that you need to run by your access surgeons and, and be, have a lot of respect for. Uh, absolutely. I concur with this. In some cases, we, uh, when we uh, see uh, calcification, we abort the, uh, the level to be involved. The five one, usually we can get there even when there's calcification. Uh, at the four or five level is the one that's the most uh, worrisome because we will have to move everything to the opposite side. So four or five, is very, it can be very dangerous. And if you see calcification, it's probably better not to try to mobilize it and to abort the four or five level. Uh, and get the correction higher. The other level, two, three, three, four, and four, uh, two, two, three, three, four, usually are not a problem because they're lateral, so you don't have to mobilize the vessels. Vince, this was a, a great session. I want to thank you and, and Cameron. The great cases, unbelievable cases. I'm glad you're in my hometown taking care of all these horrible deformities, but uh, really a yeoman's job. And also, we want to thank all the folks from the Seattle Science Foundation. Uh, they're a great crew, and they're sort of solid in the background to make this happen. We want to wish everybody a, a safe and happy 4th of July, and uh, wish us luck here in Dallas, as I hear Philly is actually coming out of the COVID, and we are just starting to get into the real heavy stuff. So thank you very much, everybody. And thanks all the fellows from uh, Penn, which is oh, happens to be my alma mater. So have a great weekend. And yeah, great you. job, Vince. Thank you, thank you for thank having me. Awesome happy, job. Happy July 4th, everyone. Thanks, Rob. A safe <laughs> one. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.